Some films were harmed in the making of this podcast. Alright, you apes. Starship Troopers November continues with Starship Troopers 2, Hero of the Federation, aka Ten Little Indians meets Invasion of the Body Snatchers in space. Would you like to know more? I'm your host, Dustin. <laughs> <laughs> that was a an aggressively enthusiastic, albeit slightly off the beaten path intro for the show. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Mike. <laughs> But considering the whole kind of idea of Starship Troopers is to just take it to 11, never look back, (laughs) and just be hyperbolic and bold, we're sticking with it. (laughs) So as Dustin said, welcome to the second episode in our Starship Troopers 20th anniversary celebration, which is going to be running through most of November. This week we're going to be talking about the second film in the Starship Troopers oeuvre. Which was written by Edward Neumeyer, directed by Phil Tippett, starring Richard Berge, Lawrence Monison, Colleen Porch, music by John W. Morgan and William T. Stromberg. It was distributed by Columbia TriStar Home Entertainment. It was a direct-to-video movie. This film did not have a theatrical release. And the company decided it only needed 5% of the original budget. (laughs) (laughs) And if I'm not mistaken, it hit video store shelves in July of 2004. And were thrown into the bargain bin in July of 2003 somehow. Now going into this whole trooper franchise thing, the movies that we are covering beyond the original film, which was on the sight and sound list. These ones are not. These ones are not. (laughs) Uh, In fact, this film is... Universally hated. It's derided, (laughs) yes. And, And honestly, when I first saw this movie back in 2004, I was working in a video store. This movie came along and it was, oh, wow, Starship Troopers sequel. I hated it. I hated it. It was one of the worst things I'd ever seen. I, and... I, I say, I'd say the same thing. I was so excited because I loved Starship Troopers and was hoping for more of the same. This movie does not really deliver. However, I revisited the movie probably somewhere between five and seven years after seeing it. I was probably just bored. I think, no, what happened was I found the DVD for like $2 or something. And I thought, well, how could I not buy it for $2? It's got special features. And the film is written by Ed Neumeyer, who wrote the original Starship Troopers. And he was on the commentary, as was Phil Tippett, the director. And and Tippett, of course, he worked on Star Wars. He worked on Jurassic Park. I mean, he's worked on so many big classic films for like Lucas and Spielberg. And uh, he worked on Robocop and Robocop 2, doing the stop motion, the Ed 209. So with all that, how can how could it be as wrong as you remember? There's a good pedigree (laughs) here. And when I watched the movie after buying it, I was like, oh, that's the kind of movie this is. And I actually I embraced it. I enjoyed it because I think like myself, most people who went into this movie thought they were going to be getting Rico and Carl and Carmen. And it was going to be crazy and gigantic and bugs and war. But this is such a different movie and if you just watch this movie for what it is it's a lot better than i think people tend to give it credit for it's like going into a movie expecting lord of the rings but getting assault on precinct 13 it's not like assault on precinct 13 is by any means bad but it's not what you were expecting (laughs) now i'm gonna be bold (laughs) Uh, having that is the theme that is the spirit of November being bold in our opinions and and what we're watching having seen this again a little bit ago and having watched it again I was really excited to watch it again tonight I really like this movie I like it a lot I mean it's a movie that was made for like 5% of the budget of the original they had no money no money whatsoever when you look at what they actually accomplished with that the script is actually pretty tight One of the things that distinguishes this movie from the original Starship Troopers is the Starship Troopers, it's gigantic. It's massive. It's You're all over multiple planets and different galaxies. You're just, you're everywhere with hundreds of thousands of people. This is so much simpler and so much more intimate and it's telling kind of one story with one group of characters. And it manages to hit a lot of the points of fascism 
that uh, you wouldn't think they'd be able to do in such a small scale, but they pull it off fantastically. And it doesn't have... I mean, it has the uh, the FedNet news bits at the beginning and the end. Not I'm, I'm done glad, as well. <laughs> I'm glad they don't interrupt the movie with them like they did in Starship Troopers because it doesn't sort of fit the tone of this. Yeah, they weren't done quite as well in, in the sense that they didn't have, you know, the same computer graphics and everything. But I still dug them. I still, I still like them. I like the fact that they used it to set the movie up and, and to be the coda at the end of the movie. I feel that the voice work just, it, it seemed a lot worse acted, especially... Uh... With the budget constraints, there was a lot less interaction with the bugs when the bugs were involved. And when you could see that the actors were firing at something that was completely off screen and they had no real way to gauge what they were doing, it didn't look super good. (laughs) I'm still going to go out on a limb and say, you know, if, if you listen to our episode last week covering Verhoeven's film, one of the things we pointed out was the way the effects in that movie, the way they blended the practical and the visual effects... They kind of knew when to light things and when not to light things. They knew how to use the effects. And I think by having Phil Tippett involved, who knows how to use effects, when the effects having were... the limitations that they had, I feel that, yes, there, there were, as you said, you know, the, the things off screen. When the effects were close up, like, I'm not going to disagree. They were really good. But the problem is, in the original, they were able to pull back and show the effects and a bunch of people from yes. further away. Here, they were zoomed right in on the people. And that was a bit weaker when they weren't able to actually do anything with the effects because, as, you, as I said, the budget constraints. But when they did have stuff, like when they have the the guy tearing the head off, hello, how's it going? <laughs> and then pulling out that sort of a parasitic bug, like, that is fantastic. I cheered when I saw that. You did. It was... I was so happy to see that. I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> it's fantastic. There's a couple cheesy lines, but they're great. I think it's worth noting that this movie was made front end to back end for less than an episode of Game of Thrones for actually millions of dollars less than an episode, a single episode of Game of Thrones or any this, of the like Netflix movie Marvel shows. This is made on the budget, same budget as Friends. Actually, way less budget than Friends because every one of them was paid a million dollars by the end. This movie is made on less than the budget of a single episode of Friends. So there's your gauge. <laughs> That's freaking ridiculous. And the time frame that they had to shoot it in as well. Uh, Phil Tippett was saying in the commentary that the opening sequence where they're up on the hill... I'm going to divert here just briefly. This movie references a lot of sort of classic Western uh, and war movies sort of at the beginning. It sort of turns into a horror movie as soon as they come up to the... uh, The abandoned... Hotel Delta. (laughs) Yeah, it's called Hotel Delta. And, And Tippett was saying that... That opening sequence, uh, Newmeyer said it was originally scripted to be much larger, but they cut it back for uh, budget and time restraints. And Tippett said that that sequence for any other film would have taken like a week to shoot. And they completed it in two seven-hour days. So considering that, <laughs> I was actually quite impressed with it. I I kind of took the movie for what it is. And for what it is, I, I really, really loved it. I, I, I know people are going to call me crazy for saying this. You know, if the original Starship Troopers was like the Star Wars of this franchise, I'm going to say that Hero of the Federation is the Empire Strikes Back of the franchise. (laughs) It's a more character-oriented story. It sort of expands the story. It develops sort of the overall threat uh, of the franchise. It's a much darker movie. And for anybody who has seen Starship Troopers 3, I'm probably going to equate it to kind of Return of the Jedi. So this all works nicely in my head. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe not yours, but... <laughs> One thing I adored is how they, they ended it, where you have Dax. The whole movie, he's very anti-government. He's he's had enough of it. He's killed a superior officer. They sort of left him there to die. And he keeps saying that, you know what? I've had enough of this. You send me a bunch of troops. I send them to the grinder. We're just getting a lot of people in order to kill them off, basically. it's kind of, Nobody cares. It's kind of a commentary on, like, the armchair general. Oh, absolutely. People just sending people off to the grinder and not caring. It's just they have an objective in mind and they don't care about the loss of life. And they talked about all the awards and the honors he's won. And he's like, you guys call me a hero. I'm not a hero. I'm just a dude. I'm just some guy. I'm a man. He never wanted any glory. So when they use the videos of him to promote glory, it is so perfect. It's absolutely perfect. The extra scene there where you have the, uh, I forget his name, Lieutenant. Dill? You're talking about the psychic? I'm talking about claw arm, robo arm from the first. 
Oh, uh, on his shirt it said Davison, which was probably a callback or a, an homage to the producer of the film, John Davison. Actually, that might have even been John Davison. Oh, I thought that was supposed to be the lieutenant from the first one. No, no, it's just a, it's just a dude. Either way. We'll... What they probably did was they probably reused the prop. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end there, they have another lieutenant coming up and saying, Oh, what a cute baby. You should grow up fast so that because we, we need more meat for the grinder. And she's just horrified at this because she was talking to Dax about how this is how they're treated. And she's like, wow, this is this is inhuman right here. The bugs might have been right. <laughs> it's funny, too, because you get told in this movie, the conceit of the first film is that essentially the Starship Troopers, Earth, us, we are the bad guys. We encroached on arachnid territory and they're retaliating. And because of our response to their destroying of the colony, they've decided they're going to wipe us out. And in this movie, this is the movie where that that statement is made sort of patently clear. They're out to wipe out our species. There's a wonderful speech at the end that Neumeier wrote that uh, Ed Lauder, who plays uh, General Shepard, that he delivers about how they're seeking order. And there's kind of a reference to sort of the hive mind and how we're basically, you know, individual and we think we have a destiny and we think we're special and we're basically agents of chaos. I mean, that sets up, we're in it. We're in it and... We have to keep fighting until we win or we die. So technically at the end when he's saying, you know, like, we need people for the mill, the grinder. We do need soldiers now. Like, (laughs) it's sort of our species depends on it, but it's still kind of a horrific thought. So I love that sort of that counterbalance that it becomes very gray morality, which I always love. And then to add a little bit of shit to the sandwich. There's a couple scenes that are just really kind of dumb when it comes to trying to take over other people. Because, of course, the bugs that they have now, you get them in the people's mouths, they go up into the brain, take over them. And it seems to be a bit of a slow process, which is awesome because the uh, that one sergeant lady who just shoots herself up with adrenaline <laughs> takes out a couple guys before shooting herself in the head because she's like, I'm not going down without fighting. Like, <laughs> that is a cold day in hell that that's happening. But you have a couple scenes where, why did you bother tying up Dax? I guess to make it easier for the bug to get into his head. I can sort of buy that. But then when you're attacking him at the end, uh, let's just walk up on him slowly like we're zombies until the other guy, who's a much older infected guy, as in he's been infected for a lot longer time. So any deterioration that may have happened, it should be on him, not these other two. He starts fighting them properly using actual speed as opposed to being a zombie it's like i was watching white zombie for a second there just sort of plodding up until they accidentally shoot each other in the head which was kind of dumb and even uh the private who keeps trying to get the main character just plodding up clunk on the head with the iron pipe clunk again this is why are you going up so slowly (laughs) <laughs> now I agree with you that the kind of zombie march towards Dax was a little slow and, and it, it was a little staged I guess but I argued with you at the time where where I said it could be because they're overly confident because the place is surrounded by thousands of bugs they're pretty confident that they're going to get the general rescued by the dropship that's coming and that he's going to infiltrate the highest levels of you know earth military and government so maybe they're just not too and they know that the bullets aren't going to kind of kill them they know that they're still inside the head and that you can still get killed that way it's I do think it's worth noting that when Private Sahara is clunking Billy on the head with that pipe, her her reactions like her Billy, reactions are great. She's never done this before and she's freaking out. <laughs> horrible noises hitting his head and he just keeps coming and she's kind of like, "How why is this not working?" and this is a horrible thing because Billy was a character that she was trying to take care of. I thought that was like a great character moment, even if it was a little bit cheesy. The one defense of his slow movement that I will give is that he's trying to convince her. He's not fully taken over yet. He's talking about how the bugs inside him and it's better than any religion that we've ever come up with sort of deal. So he's sort of a partial convert. I did dig that aspect. I completely forgot about that. It gives you a whole other level as to... Just the consciousness, the hive mind, how all that's working. And if I remember correctly, it's been a long time since I've seen Marauder, but I I think they continue to develop sort of a little bit of that religious aspect in the third movie. I mean, it's all wrapped in satire and parody. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Pantheism is a thing, so a hive mind would absolutely be a pantheistic sort of thought process. I am genuinely... I know I'm not going to like Marauder more than Hero of the Federation, but I'm, I'm genuinely kind of curious to get into Marauder 
because I don't really remember the story that well. So, and I could be surprised. I could be surprised. Whereas I've just never seen it at all. Oh, you stopped it too. You, you haven't. I stopped it too. I was barely aware that there might have been anything beyond that afterwards. And I just had my memories of two. My memories, which were flawed. The movie's actually quite good. I also just want to point it's out. It's low budget and you can see that. <laughs> but it's well written. Acting is on and off. Off at the beginning. Gets much better. <laughs> I also just want to point out, you know, you've kind of been down on the acting, but Richard Berge. Richard Berge as Dax is so great and he's so... He's never bad. He's so, like, recognizably Starship Troopers. Like, he could have been in the Verhoeven film. He takes that Ed Neumeier dialogue and he can just do it and he sells it. Uh, I love the... As I said, there's there's not any individual actor who's bad. It's just when they're doing stuff with uh, creatures that are off screen... Yeah, I mean, yeah. None of that worked. And that was everyone, whenever it happened. And that was mostly the beginning and uh, when they were surrounded the first time. Beyond that, it got so much better in my eyes. There's the sprinkles on that turd. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the music. I think the music should get a shout out too, because not having Basil Polidorus to do sort of the classic Starship Troopers theme, I still very much felt, you know, when you go low budget, a lot of times the score can kind of lift it up or it could sink it. This score was very Starship Troopers. It had some of the Polydorus themes, and, and it used them well in the places it needed to be used. And for the rest of the film, whether it was dealing with the war stuff or the horror stuff, it really underscored it well. It brought some production value, which I thought was, was really successful. I know you don't normally notice music, so you may not have a comment on that. There was some good, there was some bad, because this time you, you did talk about the music during the movie, so I was uh, actually paying attention when you spoke. As opposed to normally. <laughs> I always pay attention when you speak. What kind of a friend do you think I am? Don't answer that. Anywho, yeah, at first I remember there was some uh, music that definitely fit the theme, fit, was, fit what was going on. And I remember later on there was a couple times when the music felt a little out of place to me. I, as you said, I don't usually pay attention and I can't even remember where and when those were. I think we live in a time where... You know, back in the in the late 90s, the early 2000s, the direct-to-video stuff, it was considered... It was sort of the red-headed stepchild <laughs> of cinema. Uh, it was where you went when you had no money and you just wanted to make something or you just wanted to cash in on a franchise or an actor. You know, nowadays, direct-to-video is a completely different thing. And I think we have a more sophisticated audience and people are used to seeing different takes on things. I think that's both the strength of this and what deep six this movie with fans. Like, this movie tends to get half a star or one star out of five on ratings. Like, a lot of people really freaking hate this movie. And I'd say at minimum it should get 3.5. I agree. Bare minimum. <laughs> I agree. I think watching this now with, you know, what we're used to in, in film or direct-to-video and television and, and being able to see beyond the Verhoeven film... To be like, oh, okay, these guys, they had not a lot of money. And they were like, well, what do you do without a lot of money? You make a horror movie. So they made the, <laughs> so they made the Starship Troopers horror movie. How producers and movie companies work is entirely beyond me. It seems like a lot of the time they have no idea what the fuck they're doing. It's totally counterintuitive. Yeah. I mean, they the movie is shot very documentary style and Phil Tippett wanted to use a particular camera that was a lighter camera. But Columbia TriStar, who was distributing the picture, making the picture, is a subsidiary of Sony. And Sony was like, no, you're going to use these Sony cameras which apparently weighed as much as a TV. <laughs> so these guys, these these two camera operators were like moving around with basically something as heavy as a TV on their shoulder. And uh, there's a great moment in the commentary where Tippett mentions the Sony cameras. And I can't remember if it's Davison or Neumeier who says, and the Sony cameras were good cameras. We were happy to have the cameras. And Tippett's like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> they were heavy as fuck. It was... The, the commentary is almost as entertaining as the film itself because you really do get the sense that they pitched an idea, the studio went for the idea, they were like, if we can make this cheap enough, will you give us a green light? And they were like, yeah, why not? We'll give you a green light. And then they just kind of kept chipping away at it and you got to take 10 pages out of here and you have to use these cameras. And, and... you got to have a giant robot spider. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not going to pay for it. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean... 
I feel like anything else that I'm about to say will essentially be the summation for me. Uh, Now, we're not doing museum piece or masterpiece here because that is not the context of talking about this film. But in my opinion, this is the second best Starship Troopers movie, hands down. And I would hold it pretty close to the original Starship Troopers because I actually think the franchise is better off for having this movie in it. And I think it complements the original Starship Troopers really well. And I think the people who made it had a lot of heart. And I think they accomplished a lot with very little. And they feel like two movies that sit on on either end of a pendulum. (laughs) And I think that this is, without a doubt, the second best Starship Troopers movie that I've seen. And when I've seen a third, we'll see how that that sits. (laughs) But it is actually definitely worth a watch. The important thing is to go into it with the right expectation. Do not expect... A big action flick set in a bright planet. This is a very dark film. As Mike said, it's a haunted house sort of story. It is a very different feel. Expect to see something that's more like uh, The Thing or Invasion of the Body Snatchers, as the Dummery mentions in the beginning. But it is worth a watch and worth seeing with uh, open eyes and an open mind and an open heart. Or an open head. (laughs) (laughs) It's a siege movie, it's a horror movie, it's a western... It's an anti-fascist movie for Antifa out there. (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, So glad that I had a chance to kind of rewatch this. I'd be really curious to hear what you guys have to say if any of you are kind of keeping up and watching these movies sort of with us this november let us know what you think on uh, any of our social media we're on facebook we're on twitter we are on instagram we are on youtube we actually we've picked up uh quite a few subscribers recently on youtube which is really exciting that that the whole channel is kind of taking off in an unexpected way if you get the show off of iTunes, if you stream or download it from there, we'd love it if you rated and reviewed the show. Leave us a comment. And we're also on iHeartRadio and Stitcher. We got the WordPress blog. We're on Friendster. We're on For Affinity, Hente Foundry. Uh, <laughs> the discussion boards for Idol Champions of the Lost Relic or whatever. No, we're not. Yes, we are. Maybe I am. Not, Shut up. <laughs> not all of those listed are legitimate. <laughs> Says you. (laughs) And of course, there's the Patreon page if you want to support the show. If you want to support content like this, more content like this, uh, check out the page. Share the page with your friends. Share anything that we've got going on with your friends. Spread the word. Word of mouth is kind of the way to go. And you guys are great. So, yeah, high five if you do that. And also anything you say in the comments uh, on the YouTube page, wherever, like we will give you a shout out on the show. Join the discussion. Yeah. That's why we do this, to discuss, to revisit, review. It's not just us. We're just two assholes with an opinion. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, yeah, thanks. That's pretty much it for this episode. Thanks so much for listening, downloading, streaming, watching, and be sure to come back Thursday, I think Thursday this week is going to be an additional episode. We were originally going to do Starship Troopers 2 and 3 as one episode and then we were like, nah, you know what, let's let's split it up. So there's going to be a bonus episode with Starship Troopers 3 later in the week and then we're going to do Beach. Starship Troopers Invasion which is the first animated film next week and then a couple days after that is going to be Starship Troopers Traitor of Mars which maybe brings an end. We will see if we do Roughnecks. We might push towards that. And hey, if you want to see us or hear us do uh, an episode on Roughnecks just to keep the Starship Troopers love going through November, let us know. Send us a note. We'll probably end up doing it. Let's let's not lie here. (laughs) Your opinion matters. It's true. We're going to prove that when we do our first requested film. That's true. More on that in a future episode. So until then, I've been your host, Dustin. And I'm your host, Mike. Until next time, take care. And remember, service guarantees citizenship.
Would you like to know more?